how do you keep it up with all this new stuff? I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, constantly we talk about it. You know, a lot of the notable uh, people in the industry, you know, they are lots smarter than me, and they are saying that they have problem keeping up with, with all this new stuff. Oh, wow. Well, I, I gave up on sleep about 10 years ago, and jeez, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I, just insatiable curiosity. I mean, what do you guys do? Um, I, I get that question a lot, actually, from people about how do we keep up. And I would say, it, from my perspective, it never seems as hard as it must seem to other people. Um, the CLR 2.0 shipped in 2005, and it's still going to be the end of this year before the next version ships. So the runtime hasn't changed in 06, 07, 08, not till the end of 09 has the run, is the runtime changing. Um, C Sharp's adding a handful of features, um, but nothing really significant there either. Um, so Windows, it takes years to put out a release. I mean, Vista was, what, five years after XP? You know, so from, from my perspective, at least the stuff that I focus on, I always feel like the technology goes really slow. It's easy to keep up. So, <laughs> so yeah, I would like to say I'm sleeping better, but I don't sleep well either. And I concentrate on we my niche. Focus. So I picked my niche. Yep. Um, but if I end up moving into a new niche, then it's like overwhelming. And then I think in our in our libraries, they tend to have a little higher rev ratio. They come out a little bit sooner. And for me, it's XAML and WPF and Silverlight, and you know they're cranking those out every. Silverlight's cranking things out every 12 months, 14 months. Two weeks. <laughs> so I chose more wisely. You back. did. Yeah. <laughs> the lower down the stack you are, the slower things change. So. Yeah, yeah, they can't change languages as, as quickly as they can. ASP.NET moves fast, so we have a lot of stuff coming out. So it's a lot of blogs and forums and interaction with the team. Uh, that kind of stuff helps, you know, with a lot of book work and everything, and just trying stuff out. I've been doing this a long time, not as long as, as Procise here. Since he started when Babbage was going. Um, wow, that went over everybody's head. Uh, but, you know, back back in the 90s, I found it a lot harder, right? You know, I, I worked at New Mag, I was working on tools like Soft Ice. And, you know, we used to actually schedule, okay, well, we want to know how this works. We would put in the schedule like a three week task to go figure out how, you know, uh, you know to load library work. Right, but I think one of the things that's changed in the business is is blogs.msdn.com, and that's made it tremendously easier because the folks on the teams are now talking about it a lot more. So you know, sure, I might not do a lot of SharePoint stuff, but we have the resources like Scott was talking about today. But uh, and I think that makes it a little bit easier, you know, because I, I kind of you know debugging and performance tuning kind of touches on a little bit of everything. So you know, I couldn't even set up a SharePoint site, but I can go figure out probably some website or email mark, kind of figure out how SharePoint works under the hood when somebody's looking at a performance problem. So, you know, I think that that's made it a lot easier, right? You know, I mean, how did we ever live before Google, right? It, you know, it's, it, it's AG, your BG and AG, you know, before Google and after Google. It's a whole different world uh, now. So, I think it's easier, you know. But it was easier in the DOS days, wasn't it? There's two, there's two books on your shelf. You can't well, the APIs were a lot smaller then, right? You could keep a lot of the APIs in your head. Yeah, it was just you know, two books. Right? Ralph, Brown, Ralph Brown's Interrupt book, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just lost half the audience. <laughs> What's the future of Windows Forms is what I'm hearing is the question. Yeah, I'd say it's mature technology, which is Microsoft's euphemism for we're not going to do any, anything else to it. It's uh, yeah. We'll do some bug fixes, but we're not going to do any functionality. All I had heard rumors at uh, Mix that there might be, not Mix, MVP Summit, there might be something new in the works, but I doubt it. So I did yeah. I did WinForms development, and I did ActiveX before that, um, and with the, the VB5 and 6. And um, so I think it was a good transition story from that world to WinForms. When you move, it's stable, it's not going anywhere, but so now you've got to choose, if you want to build on a new platform, you've got to pick WPF or Silverlight, because they're the two rich client front ends that Microsoft's producing. Okay, so that's a different question, though, which one of those platforms you pick. So, we also discussed this, this similar question to him, but, but with ASP.NET, I mean, is it going away because of Silverlight? No. 
was okay. We have a couple of further. That was totally objective. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> So let's take the silver white versus WPF first. Okay. Um, well, um, I, I can give you um, some opinions, I guess, uh, with silver light um, and with, a, with ASP.NET, which Rachel and I both have a bit of a vested interest in. Um, ASP.NET is certainly not going to go away anytime soon. Um, I tell people that uh, 100 years from now, I'm sure, there will be HTML web apps out there somewhere. Now, the companies that own those apps are going to be hopelessly outdated, but those apps are still going to be out there somewhere. Um, I do think, however, that you're going to see more and more RIA technologies like Silverlight uh, used in coming years, and you will see, I think, uh, the percentage of applications that are traditional, you know, ASP.NET slash HTML slash JavaScript slash AJAX applications uh, diminish uh, as a percentage of the whole. Um, you, you said Silverlight uh, sort of uh, to you is uh, uh, a thin client technology, whereas WPF is more of a thick client. Um, I think that's actually a pretty good analogy. Uh, I mean, the whole thing about Silverlight, of course, is that it's, uh, it's a WPF subset, but you don't have to have the .NET framework on uh, that machine to run Silverlight. You don't even have to have Windows on that machine. It can be the Mac OS, or today you can even be um, Linux. Uh, still, there are some cool things you can do in WPF that you cannot do in Silverlight. And uh, although that delta between the two, I think, will uh, diminish over time, there will probably always be a few really cool things you can do in WPF you can't do in Silverlight. So, um, when it comes to deciding whether to use Silverlight or WPF, you know, if I work in a shop where I'm building software for internal consumption. I control the desktop, and I know the .NET Framework 3.0 or higher is on those machines. No question about it, I would use WPF for that because it's not going to be as limiting uh, as Silverlight is. But if what I value more than anything else is reach, so that I can write this code and it's going to run just about anywhere, anywhere that has a browser, then Silverlight is the way I'm going to go uh, there. Yeah, as long as you can live with the limitations of what it provides, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So your Silverlight is not as many features. It's still, it's got some pluses that WPF doesn't have. But it's also got a lot of things that, that WPF can do things that Silverlight can't do yet. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, Silverlight three, that, that gets a lot closer. And Microsoft tells us sometimes that they plan on doing parity, and then later they say they're not going to do it, and so it them down. Each team writes their own stuff, and the other team goes, mm -hmm. I should use that. Visual State Manager. I think we're um, kind of the delta between the two getting smaller and smaller, though. I agree with what Jeff said. Uh, you, when you pick it, um, you know, if you know you're going to run on, on a Windows operating system um, and you've got a captive audience, like I said, within a corporation, then um, it doesn't seem like it's like too big a, a jump to say we should do that all at WPF. Um, <coughs> WPF, of course, it, it, remember the main reason why it's out there is. Microsoft needed a new way of rendering graphics, and they already had DirectX, but they had no programming engine for that for the business client. And so, WinForms is based in GDI, right? and it's pretty much a 22-year-old technology. And yet, we've got DirectX, which is, has this huge amount of graphics capability, and Microsoft had no um, business platform for writing the front end so could exploit that power. And you could write, you could use game programming software, but that's really hard to. Do. Do database connections do that. So, um, and then you know, Silverlight's got the outer browser experience, which is another piece of this. So, in Silverlight three, it's going to even get closer because now you can take a Silverlight application and basically detach it from the web and run it on your local desktop, and that makes it even more like WPF. But the thing to remember about that is. Um, it's in. It's still running in the browser, even though it's detached. It's called out of browser, but you know when you fire that up on your local machine, it's really running an instance of a browser and running inside that, which means it's running in the same security context that uh, it would if it was running um, connected to the internet. What do you want to say about ASP.NET? Uh, yeah, it'll be around for at least a little while. Uh, some of the more rich clients are going to definitely, and they do have a niche. Uh, but JavaScript is going to be a lot like C++, right? It's still out there running a lot of stuff, and it's going to be hard to purge it, right? So rich clients on, or rich in feature, 
right, not in like fat clients, on the internet are going to be around for a little while. Um, so we're going to have more of a broader reach, um, more platforms available with JavaScript and AJAX, right, not just ASP.NET AJAX. Um, and then, of course, Silverlight would be the other one uh, for some of the rich features on the internet. So I think that's where that's more going to go. So it'll be a while before it all, you know, <coughs> ASP.NET starts to fade out. So. Where does jQuery fit in the Oh, yeah. See, jQuery, yeah. See, those <coughs> are some of the investments that uh, Microsoft has in IntelliSense now and Visual Studio for jQuery in uh, 2008. So jQuery <coughs> exists solely to make JavaScript suck less. <laughs> right. So uh, you know, because everybody hates JavaScript except a few Looney Tunes, right? <laughs> Myself, right? So with jQuery, of course, you can just integrate that right into any solution that you have. Start writing your jQuery scripts just like it's JavaScript. Uh, so that's independent of ASP.NET, but it works very nicely with ASP.NET. And of course, the team is building the features into Studio to do IntelliSense and all that other good stuff. And don't forget MVC. And MVC too. And MVC too. Which yeah, works with that. jQuery and AJAX, and <coughs> that's on top of ASP.NET too. Well, I've got a question for you guys. How many of you guys are using TFS? <coughs> <coughs> Two and a half. Two and, and a half. half. <laughs> in, in the future, how, how many of you planning on using TFS? <coughs> what are the rest of you using? What is TFS? Okay, <laughs> DT Foundation <laughs> Server. Uh, the Microsoft version control bug tracking and work item stuff. You know, what, do, what, do, what are the rest of you using? Subversion. Subversion. Uh, custom scripts. Okay. Ooh. Soda pop cans. Anybody still use those? <laughs> <laughs> check out, check in. Yeah. Yeah. Zip files. Zip files. Well, I'm, I'm just surprised. For those of you that, that aren't using TFS, I'm surprised Microsoft hasn't come down and just given you a copy yet. You know, because they're, they're desperate to take over that market in a, in a major way. So, How many of you still using Visual Studio 2005 most of the day? Maybe? Any of you still doing native code? What's that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I am too, don't feel bad, it's okay. We, we can commiserate together later. Um, well, what's the, what's the future of that? Because I mean, when it first came out, 2005, mm -hmm. <clears throat> We, we couldn't even install it in our company. And they, yeah. they tried for like two solid weeks, two guys dedicated yeah. to it, and they just gave up. Yeah. And they were all fired up. It sounded yeah. great because we had um, doors which we were supposed to be able to integrate with for the, for the requirements management and all yeah. that. And they just couldn't get it going. And I heard in 2008, it step forward, but mm -hmm. are they going to continue it and expand on it, or are they just going to fix it so that you can do it? They're, uh, they're, they've made uh, a, a major investment in, in, in it. Microsoft, um, let's see how much I can say, they're using it. DevDiv is using it for the, the uh, DevDiv is, is the Visual Studio Developer uh, Division. They're using it for uh, building uh, Visual Studio 2010. Yeah. But they've learned a lot from that. And uh, you know the goal is that a manager can install it. No offense to managers, uh, <laughs> because you know they saw that pain, and um, they're putting a tremendous amount of effort into making it easier. I think you're going to see some interesting things about. Uh, they they also realize that people don't want to run their own. You know, I kind of like to you know like you can go to Microsoft Online and host an Exchange server. Why can't we host a TFS server? Okay. So I think you're, you're going to see a lot of effort, you know, going on. You know, code. Yes, right. Codeplex is based off TFS, and uh, I, you're going to see uh, a lot of the noise coming up in Dev 10 is TFS based. Well, one of the concerns I know they're talking about it where I, I just sort of talking about migrating over. And they've got all their custom stuff in this version and all that. Mm -hmm. And one of the concerns that was brought up by pretty much everybody that mentioned is not migrating on code. Mm -hmm. Are they going to any? Uh, uh, Efforts for migration from different platforms. Say, obviously, it's you know, source safe, but yeah, the version was. Yeah, I, I think they, they do have an, a, 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 a subversion migrator already. Gotcha. All right, so you know they you know they want to do they want to make it as painless as possible <laughs> for you to spend money, uh, and uh, <coughs> so they they yeah, and so they they've done a lot of work. They're they're um, uh, I don't know how. 
they're going to have that answer. Let's just put it that way. I, I would say, you know, where they're going to go. But that that is very, very high on their list of priorities. And I think that, uh, you know, when you start looking at, at some of the stuff that they've announced, like at the PDC, uh, you know, they have uh, the testing system now where you can run the tests, and from the test, you create work items. Right, so you know, add, add, you know, and, and they've got the, they've got a UI testing tool coming up in, in, in the next version of Visual Studio. Does not require TFS, but if you have TFS, it becomes instantly more valuable because you can be doing your know, manual test, and what it does is it records the screen into a WMV file. Then uh, you you know, so you do you, it does two things: it records the screen and it uses the historical debugging so that you give to the developer when they file the bug report. You get the screen, the the video of the screen, and you get the historical debugging so that the developer can play back the bug the tester saw. And that requires TFS. Okay, and when you see some of those demos, it's it's very very compelling. It's really really mind blowing because it you know it, it they their whole goal with this. And you know, I work a lot with the diagnostic team. The whole goal was was to eliminate the no repro problem, right? Because we've all been in the ping pong, right? <laughs> QA says, "Well, here's the bug, <laughs> no repro." <laughs> Pings back, you know, QA, "Oh, we repro it all the time. Oh, I can't repro it on my desktop," you know. And they wanted to completely eliminate that, and they're pretty close, pretty close. Yeah. But they still have the case you touched on it, about the money. It's still a very expensive uh, solution. They're competing well against the rational yeah. products. Yeah. Yeah. But to be honest, the rational product suite is marketed at the enterprise client. Yeah. So even the enterprise clients, you end up with the case where, unless they decide to adopt it across the firm mm -hmm. and fund it, mm -hmm. you're not going to get it. I like the theory yeah. that you could have your yeah. testers on it, you could have this, until you run the spreadsheet and you go, hey, look at the bottom line, and run up yeah. management for funds. Yeah. Well, you know, and that, that's where, where the sale, in my opinion, the sales guy hasn't done the job, because I think one of the things that TFS gives you is um, the reports to management. Right, because what does management care about? What are you doing every day? Because they want to tell their manager what you're doing every day. And you know, if you if you you buy that and buy into that, that's what TFS can tell you. Because you know, there's there's a lot of stuff there. So that's just a sales guy not really doing their job, in in, in my opinion. And I think you know, rational tools can do that as well. But I think uh, you know, some of the the Microsoft, let's put it this way, understands the cost issue. And um, how do I say this carefully? Uh, pay attention to some of the Brian Harry's blog, and I think there might be some very interesting things that uh, can, you know, they want everybody to adopt it, and I think that there might be some things coming up that can facilitate that adoption, uh, that allows people to start using it to see the value of it but then make a very compelling case inside the enterprise without having to weigh it out, you know, the money for everybody. Yeah. Okay. What Microsoft usually done in the past is they yeah. have windows and everything as a department. Yeah. So show the value of the department right. yeah. and grow up. That and then, yeah, they, they had to go the other right, time. right, and, and they realize they haven't, they, they, they've got, you know, this top down <coughs> thing and they haven't provided anything bottom up, right, because, you know, they're, they're, they still got to support source safe or source unsafe. Uh, so uh, you know, and they'd like to get out of that business. So there's there's some interesting stuff. You know, just pay attention. Yeah. Brian Harry's ball. Yeah, they, they announced that they're going to sunset uh, DSS. Right, and there and there's a reason that they're doing that. So that's what you want to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Did you just parse that last sentence correctly? <laughs> you know, but uh, Brian Harry's the guy in charge for those of you that don't know, and and he's going to have some interesting announcements uh, on his blog that, that talk about some of this stuff. Uh, you know. Brian Harry. H A R R Y. Brian. Just like the first name. So, uh, so the next version is going to install? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is well, wait for the big announcement. Yeah, 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 wait, yeah. Wait, wait for the announcement. Yeah. You didn't hear it here. <laughs> Yeah, but you know you're exactly right. They you know, but there there's uh you know they want you know they're trying to get the one click install and, and you know they're they're uh, 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 Will Peter uh, I can't remember his last name. He, he's running a bunch of range of projects that they want this to you know they want an automated install. You know why why should you and I you know be become network admin gurus to get you know some product you know productivity tools installed? So. Well, I mean, you made a good point too that you know you sell it across the platform. We. The developers obviously because we're not, but the 
business analysts yeah. because of the ping pong that you're talking about. It's like, I told you to do such and such. And you never put that environment down. You had traceability throughout the system, right. and that's key. I mean, and yeah. you can sell that as a time saver. Look at how many days mm -hmm. we saved on our schedule, man, hours, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. So they sell it that way. They'll just see because I know that's what we wanted. Mm -hmm. Nerd wanted it, but also the business analysts, QA, and then all that. Yeah, we, we, did a, we did a lot of work for a bank in England where we, we, uh, we built a big TFS custom TFS stuff with them, and uh, it was really interesting. What happened is their big thing was time track, right? Because you know everybody estimates, estimates, and then you might as well just throw it away, right? You know because nobody ever updates that document again. They tied all of the time estimates into the actual requirements features, and so they tracked all this down the estimates. Then what they did is they did a version. Uh, of the software where they said, okay, here's what everybody estimated. They didn't hold everybody to it. Then they had the actual, you know, you couldn't check anything in, you couldn't fix anybody, you had to say how long it took. So they had what everybody estimated, then they had the actual time. And it was the first time they'd ever seen that. They were kind of like, wow, this is kind of interesting. We found out that some people do a really good job of sandbagging. Some people don't know how to make an estimate to get themselves out of a wet paper bag, right? So uh, they had a pretty good feel you know, over one development cycle what this meant. And they were able to take that and on the next version, they were able to sit down and get very good estimates because they people saw a one-to-one -one matching between, well, this requirement was estimated to be three and a half weeks total, but it took us four weeks. And the four people working on it, well, they had, you know, these problems and so they were able to start tightening up uh, the stuff. And boy, they, they've been getting some very good estimates on their stuff because they were able to tie this information together. And I think it doesn't matter if you use TFS or anything else. I mean, that's really what you want, yeah. right? Because if it, you know, how many of you ship software on time? Ever? Right? Yeah, ever. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, because the first time you ship software on time, the management just passes out. You know, they've just never seen that before. You know what happens the second time when you duplicate, do it a second time? They, they, they just get giddy and start letting you do whatever you want. The third time you ship software on time, you can kill somebody in the lobby and the management just goes, oh, those engineers are so funny. Right? Wow, that's great. <laughs> you know, because you know, once you, sh you know, demonstrate that you can ship on, uh, uh, you know, very, very close to your schedule, you know, they love you from then on. And that's what these guys were after, right? And it doesn't matter what tool you use, you know, at the end of the day, they just ship on time. Right? You know, they meet your requirements. Link? I'm going to hand that to me. Yes. That's um, Link, how broadly has been adopted? The general consensus within Microsoft is that Link has not been adopted as well as they originally thought that it would be. Um, and then there was the Link to SQL kind of fiasco thing that like almost immediately after it shipped, Microsoft said, we're kind of done with that now and we'll do Link to Entities instead discussion. Um, I personally have found Link to be there's a lot of things you have to learn to really understand it. If you want to understand it and how it works, that's there's a pretty good significant uptick there, I think, to get extension methods, land expressions, um, maybe anonymous types if you're using that, all that kind of stuff fit into query expressions and all that to really get that down. And then the debugging experience, people complain about that too. Um, and I've also been bitten by that. Sometimes I'll take my Lambda expression out of the link query and I'll get that debugged. And then after I have that working, I'll put it back in. But that really defeats the whole purpose of link. Right? The whole purpose was to have an easy programming model and now I have to pull things out of it to get it to work so I can put it, make it easy again. It's, that's not making it easy anymore. So, um, I mean, it's certainly not dying. There's people who are still building on top of it. It will be enhanced some in .NET 4.0. There will be other things that support it. Um, and it still has great potential. And there's parallel leadership <coughs> in .NET 4, so you can put as parallel on some query and it'll run on multiple processors. Um, but that's a double-edged sword, too. So if it's something simple, it'll actually run slower. And if it's something complex, then you might see a benefit. So it's... Where the, the fear <laughs> is that people will just put as parallel on, yeah, on the whole thing and then say, well, now it's faster and we're done. <laughs> um, Isn't that true? Yeah, yeah so, um, and we're looking at that, people doing that to save our company. Yeah. yeah. So then we'll go in and we'll fix it because I'll be, why is it so slow? And then we'll remove as parallel and we'll charge for a week of work or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I, I should have kept the business model. Yeah, there's the That's right. It's a private email. I forgot. <laughs> so 
Um, so I, I think it has potential. It's still going to live on. There's still work that's being done to it. And uh, I think some people are finding it very useful. And, and I use uh, pieces of it um, in my own work uh, quite a bit, bits and pieces of it here and there. So anyway, I just want to comment on it. They always go for right to link to SQL, forgetting about everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a big discussion in my data access talk about how link is not just linked to SQL. Um, so there's a lot of link technologies, and link is language, it's a language feature, language integrated query, right? So the IN for integrated key for query, right? And if you didn't have IN, right, it would be what? Lick, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good acronym. Right? Other, other than that, though, everybody does. They think it's linked to SQL. I thought about that. <laughs> Well, that's a big thing. Yeah. You don't need the end, except it would be lick. <laughs> Language yeah. integrated query unleashed. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, even worse. <laughs> so, um, so we were talking about like XML, link to XML, is using link to be able to query XML documents, which is way better than anything out of system.xml, as far as syntactically and the volume of code needed to be able to just work with it. Uh, like Jeffrey mentioned, you do need that little optic with the learning curve and lambdas and things, but once you get over that hump, you are able to query objects that are in memory. And th that could be anything, an array, a list, a group of things, just anything that you need. It can come from SQL or it could come from Entity Framework or whatever provider is available for Link. All right, so it's not just linked to SQL, it's just about querying and making querying a first class citizen inside of the language and not just leaving it out to your database to be the only queryable thing and having to call out to that to get data. You can just query things that are in memory. It's anything with ienumerable, right? Yeah, anything with ienumerable. Yeah. yeah, so that's what you start looking for. You start looking at, at um, methods or or properties on types that return a, an array or a, you know, a list of T or whatever, and it's like, hmm, this is a queryable source. That's where right. you start going, I can query this. Yeah. I don't know what to query it for yet, but you know, <laughs> for reflection or anything else. I was thinking of something when you were talking about your debugging experiments, changing the subject here for a second, but an interesting thought came out of these. Um, we're getting more and more declarative things coming in language, like XAML and Link and how do we solve the debugging issue? That's a bigger issue. There's no debugging story right now in when you have declarative languages. It's just this opaque, uh, put this in here, and if it doesn't work, too bad. There's nothing. So I was just interested if anybody in the panel has any ideas on how do you solve that problem. Link doesn't even work in the immediate point. Yeah. yeah. It's really painful. How you do you can at least step into it. Yeah, how do you step you through, <laughs> you know, the with the uh, you know the order by in a link query or in XAML? How do you step through? You've got a binding problem. I mean, they fix some of that, but well, you just open up the unambiguous window, the disassembly window, and the assembler tells you what's going on, right? But then you got to get from that yeah, back to the markup. That's a little tricky. <laughs> <laughs> you got my joke. <laughs> quick look at the code here that makes this work. It's pretty darn simple, folks. There are two new classes named Local Message Receiver and Local Message Sender. Um, in my sender here, uh, here's what I do. When the thing starts up, I register a local message sender, and I simply pass in a stringified name. This is what connects them together, because my receiver is going to new up a local message receiver class that passes in this name as well. Although I haven't shown it here, there is support for scoping this. You may only want to connect to uh, senders or receivers using this name that came from your domain or from specified other domains. So that's how you scope it, so that if by some coincidence another Silverlight app that you know nothing about that uses the same name to register with senders and receivers is running, you can scope it by domain so that you don't connect to those. But all I do in my sender now is each time the mouse moves with the button down, you can see me here creating a new XAML line object and adding it to the scene, but at the end, I call local message sender send async to send a message over to any receivers that are connected. It is a, publish, a true publish subscribe mechanism, and I'm simply passing a string that contains the coordinates, starting in any coordinates of that line. Then I have here a separate project that represents the receivers. 
if you look in there, you'll see that when they start up, they knew about the local message receiver class passing in that same uh, identifier. And now they simply call listen. That's an async or call that returns immediately. That every time a message arrives from a sender, this will be called. And what I do here is I'm just doing some simple deserialization right here to convert that into a point object and draw an identical line down the receiver. And as you saw, I had to do absolutely nothing to get it to work across process boundaries. Wow. It just worked. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Executing right now on this thread full thread. I then asked Windows Forms, hey, do I need to call and vote because I, am I a thread that other than the one that created this control? And it says, yes, you do need to call and vote. And then I say, well, what if I don't? And I just go and try to change the text of this control. And then it says, well, then you can't do that. And I'm telling you by throwing you an invalid operation exception. Then I say, what's the message in that exception? And it pops up and it says, cross thread operation not valid. This control was accessed from a thread other than the thread it was created on. So that's the proof that you have to update UI components using the thread that you created the UI component with. And to this method, and here's what's cool. When it calls back into the method, the method does not begin running, does not run at the beginning. It runs from where it left off. So when the next time we call count to, it actually starts up the for loop. And then it says, oh, let me set n equal to 2. If n is less than 5, then let's yield return 2. So now a 2 comes back here and gets displayed. Then when we loop back around and we call this method again, it picks up from the n plus plus. Because that's the next thing that would have happened. And so this becomes a 3, and then it returns 3, 4, and 5. And then it leaves this method, because the for loop would be none. That tells for each to cut it out, don't call it ever again, and then whatever code you have below picks up continuing the code. Right? And this feature was added for people writing collection classes so that they could easily write a state machine that could be used with for each to return, let's say, all the elements of a tree. Because if you had to write the state machine yourself, it's really very tricky. So you get this simplified syntax. Now another way I could have written this, by the way, is I could delete this first line of code and put a one here. Okay, then I would have gotten the same result. I support the asynchronous programming model. I mentioned that. Um, I have these usage patterns here um, where you can issue one operation and then process it when it completes. You can issue many operations and process after all of them complete. You can issue many operations and process them as each one completes. You can issue other iterators. I support composition and subroutines. Um, I have a sync gate class that allows you to do some thread safety stuff. It's kind of advanced. I don't think I want to get into it. I also offer discard support. Imagine a scenario where you want to get the temperature of New York. So you go to a server and say, what's the temperature in New York? What's the temperature in New York? What's the temperature in New York? Now, theoretically, they're all going to return the same value because the temperature is whatever there it is. And so you could say, I will issue all three, and yield return one. So as soon as the first one comes back, I call into you, and then you can tell me, I don't care about the rest. Discard them. And then when they do come back, I'll throw it all away. I'll call the end methods automatically for you. I'll just get rid of it all. So now, whichever one came back first, that's the fastest. And now you keep running and you just go. Um, uh, I have that. And then issue many, process until timeout, or issue many and process until cancellation. And then one more thing I want to show. Oh, I'll mention this too. So for additional references, just to learn about C-sharp, anonymous methods, lambdas, and iterators, I recommend the C-sharp language specification. It is incredibly dry reading, very, very painful. But it is the definitive word on the subject. So I recommend reading that. If you want to use these constructs with asynchronous programming, I wrote three articles in my concurrent affairs column in MSDN Magazine. And here are the links to those three articles. It talks about using anonymous methods, lambdas, and iterators. Then, uh, this async enumerator class is in my power threading library, which is available for free. You download it from Wintelec's website. I have set up a Yahoo group for, um, for free support. So people can ask questions on this group. So most of the time I reply, almost always I reply. Sometimes other people chime in too with something as well. I created a video which is available on channel 9 to walk through this. I did a geek speak uh, video as well. Or uh, eh, I guess it's a video. You don't see me, but you see my screen as I'm walking through code. And this one shows the Silverlight version of the library.
And in Silverlight, everything you must do asynchronously. They don't give you synchronous APIs in Silverlight because then you would hang the whole browser. The user wouldn't be able to switch to other tabs. So in Silverlight, you must do everything asynchronously. You have to. And using this async enumerator with that, it's, it's a beautiful fit.